based by uh, dysymplectic quotient. So that's a very basic example. An example that is more interesting, um, uh, at least uh, from some perspective, is the modular space um, of uh, flat connections. Um, so what you're looking at there is uh, you have a compact surface S and you fix a G bundle um, over this uh, surface and you look at all the connections that um, have a flat curvature um, and then you quotient out by the symmetry and that's in this case the symmetry is the gauge group of the principal bundle. And it was observed by Atia and Bot that uh, this modular space of flat connections uh, also has a symplectic structure. And uh, similarly to the projector space, you can also realize this uh, as a, a symplectic reduction. Um, in this particular case, the, the momentum map is given by the curvature and uh, use, uh, that's for the action of the gauge transformations. So if you set it to zero, that's the zero level set of the momentum map and then you quotient out the gauge group. Um, so that's uh, again, a symplectic uh, quotient. And another important modularized space, which will be uh, the main protagonist of uh, today's talk is the Teichmüller space. So there you also started with a compact uh, surface and uh, instead of connections, you're looking uh, at a Riemannian matrix. And you, what you require is that uh, these Riemannian matrix have curvature, uh, scalar curvature, um, which is given by minus one, constant scalar curvature minus one. And the uh, different morphism groups um, that preserves uh, a given volume form uh, is the symmetry and you quotient out um, usually by the identity component to get the Teichmüller space. Um, if you quotient out by the full different morphism group, you get uh, the Riemann uh, modular space, which has some singularities. And uh, it's also a pretty uh, uh, fundamental observation by Weil and Peterson that there is a natural symplectic structure on this uh, Teichmüller space. And then you sit down and think, okay, like uh, then uh, the scalar curvature, I mean, if you look at these uh, and compare them to a symplectic reduction, um, you want to realize this Teichmüller space also as a symplectic reduction because it looks like one. So you want to say that uh, the scalar curvature is the uh, momentum map, then you set it to minus one, that's the uh, momentum level set, and then the diffeomorphism group um, should be the symmetry. So this, in some sense, you want to say that uh, in the Teichmüller space is a symplectic um, quotient. And for this, you need to uh, study um, uh, momentum maps for the different morphism group and uh, want to show that the scalar curvature is really the momentum map for the natural different morphism action. And uh, this problem attracted uh, interest quite early. Um, I was told that uh, already Marston worked on this in the 80s. Um, and also there was some more recent work by Simon Donaldson on this. And uh, it actually turns out to be really complicated um, to look at momentum maps um, for different morphism groups. And uh, in some sense, today's talk is about why it's uh, so complicated and what can you actually do um, um, to still make sense of momentum maps for different morphism groups. That's for the general motivation. Um, first start by just like fixing some uh, notation and uh, recalling uh, the well-known um, procedure of symplectic reduction. So we start with some uh, uh, manifold. Um, for the moment, assume that everything is finite dimension. Uh, I will comment about the infinite dimensional case in a second. And we have a symplectic structure, which is just a closed non-degenerate two form on M. And we assume that we have some limit uh, Lie group G that acts on M and uh, preserves the symplectic form. Then you know that uh, there exists uh, the momentum map, which uh, uh, takes values in the dual of the Lie algebra and uh, which satisfies uh, this equation that if you plug in the fundamental vector field generated by a Lie algebra element, then uh, this is an exact uh, form and it's given by the pairing of the momentum map of this uh, Lie algebra element. And this momentum map uh, encodes the conserved quantities. And the really important uh, procedure by, uh, of symplectic reduction, which was introduced by Marsden and Weinstein, says that if you have a, a momentum value that, uh, and uh, you look at the inverse image of the, um, this momentum uh, value under the momentum map and you quotient out the stabilizer of the momentum map, um, momentum value, sorry, then uh, you get again uh, a symplectic manifold. And uh, that's uh, at least under some certain regularity conditions, for example, that the action is free and proper. 
Um, so that's the uh, well-known um, uh, procedure of symplectic reduction. And um, in our setting, we are working actually in infinite dimensions. So the next thing I want to discuss is um, which problems arise once you go to the infinite dimensional uh, theory and uh, which problems you have to face if you um, want to uh, work with infinite dimensional symplectic geometry. And the first one is already coming up. Um, the first problem is already coming up when you uh, want to say what actually is a symplectic uh, um, form. So usually you say that in finite dimensions, you have this um, the non-degeneracy condition. And uh, what this means is that uh, um, that you have this uh, uh, yeah, map assigned to the, uh, to the symplectic form that maps a tangent vector to a dual tangent vector. And, uh, and you say that uh, this map needs to be uh, surjective that's uh, or bijective in, in, fin uh, in finite dimensions. And um, that's uh, also a condition you can impose in infinite dimensions, but then you look at most examples and it turns out that this map is uh, almost never subjective, but uh, it's uh, uh, only injective. So um, you have to uh, work with these uh, examples where this uh, map is uh, not subjective, but only injective. And uh, once you relax this condition uh, that this map is only uh, so, uh, injective and not subjective, you get a lot of problems. Um, for example, one of them is that um, and if you take twice of the, uh, like you have a subspace uh, of the symplectic space and you take uh, um, twice its uh, symplectic orthogonal, then in finite dimension, that's uh, the same uh, space again. And in infinite dimension, that's no longer true. Um, so that's uh, in this particular, uh, it's uh, always, or like there are subspaces where this one is strictly bigger than um, the, the space that you started with. And then, um, for example, this property is really uh, uh, used in the bifurcation lemma that tells you something about the kernel and the image of the momentum map. Um, so uh, the bifurcation lemma is uh, uh, wrong um, because, or like doesn't hold anymore in infinite dimensions because you have this property that um, the double symplectic orthogonal is no longer the same space. Um, and there are even more problems. For example, the Dabu theorem uh, no longer holds. There's a famous uh, counter example by Marsden in, from the 70s already, um, which shows that uh, in infinite dimensions, uh, the Dabu theorem uh, fails. Um, so this means also that the classical proof that you have, for example, for um, more involved normal forms like the Malekulum and Sternberg uh, normal form um, also doesn't work anymore. So that's uh, already kind of like problems that you have to face if you work in the banner setting, but there's uh, even uh, more trouble coming because usually you are not even in a banner setting. Um, so what do I mean with this is that uh, um, many symmetry groups that you want to look at are not uh, Banach-Li groups. So one of the most uh, uh, important examples of this is the diffeomorphism group. So if you want to say that a diffeomorphism group with a certain Sobolev or smooth um, grading um, is a uh, banach group, um, uh, then you would say that the, the multiplication um, needs to be smooth map. And uh, in this particular case, the multiplication is just uh, given by composition of different morphisms. And if you take the derivative, then you say, um, see that um, this, um, that you take the derivative of one of the different morphisms. So this means that if your different morphism have only a certain degree of regularity, then uh, the multiplication uh, uh, map is no longer smooth. So this means that in particular that uh, you're not working any longer in the Banach uh, setting um, and uh, you need to go to a more general setting and that's uh, uh, the Frisch setting, the Frisch category, because the smooth different morphism uh, group is really a Frisch D group or the group of uh, different morphisms, smooth different morphisms. But once you want to uh, work in the Frisch setting, um, you have the problem that there is no longer an uh, easy inverse function theorem. There's uh, one, but it's uh, that's the nash moser inverse function theorem, but uh, the conditions uh, to apply this inverse function theorem in the Frisch setting are way more involved than the usually inverse function theorem, for example, in the Banach setting. And then there is a, um, even more trouble coming and that's uh, the particular case that our standard example that you kind of like uh, start kind of like as a basic example of symplectic geometry and which is uh, also the model case um, is no longer actually in the category that you're working on. So if you have a Frisch manifold, um, 
um, then the cotangent bundle is no longer a smooth bundle. Um, so the, uh, that's, um, yeah, the reason is because there's a, um, the pairing between uh, the, the vector space and its two is no longer uh, smoothly, um, uh, it's no longer smooth or kind of like um, um, jointly continuous. Um, so that uh, shows you that uh, the cotangent bundle is not a smooth bundle anymore. Uh, and so you don't even have a natural example um, to look at uh, for Frisier manifolds. So these are kind of like, a, I don't want to demotivate you um, with the slide and I don't want to say like, you shouldn't look uh, at, uh, not look at infinite dimensions. It's just like that uh, the infinite dimensional setting is way worse uh, than what you used to uh, from finite dimensional symplectic geometry. And uh, in my PhD thesis, um, I spent uh, a lot of uh, time looking at these kind of problems and um, actually made a, a symplectic reduction work in this infinite dimensional setting of Frisier manifolds. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail because it's uh, not really related to what I want to talk about today. Um, but just let, let me uh, kind of like give you uh, the main idea is, uh, yeah, the main idea. And that's uh, not just like working with the Dabu theorem, which gives you in finite dimensions uh, the normal form that you want for your momentum map. But instead you use um, ideas that were developed for um, moduli spaces. Um, and these are the Kuranichi structures, um, which give you uh, a normal form for the momentum map and not a normal form for the symplectic uh, form. But that's already enough um, for symplectic reduction. And um, that uh, can, you can use to uh, do a symplectic reduction in infinite dimensions. Okay, so um, that's for uh, the general problems that you have to face if you want to work in infinite dimensions. And um, now we uh, look at um, particular, or I want to look at a particular example um, where we uh, see the first time um, the different morphism uh, group uh, acting and um, uh, also, which is uh, in some sense the, the new model space that we want to look at because mapping spaces are, um, so the cotangent bundle was no longer um, an example of a symplectic manifold. So we need some uh, other nice spaces uh, to work with and the mapping spaces are in some sense uh, the most natural candidates that we can look at for infinite dimensional symplectic uh, spaces. Okay, so what we have is a compact manifold um, uh, S that is uh, induced uh, uh, endowed with a volume form. And we are looking at some uh, um, symplectic manifold M. And um, we look uh, at the space of all smooth functions from S uh, that takes values in M. And we can define uh, the uh, in a symplectic structure on this space. So. If I want to define a symplectic structure on uh, this infinite dimensional space, I first need to say what are the tangent vectors um, at some given function. And these are the vector fields along this function. So um, our symplectic form on the, the space uh, takes uh, three arguments. The first one is a smooth function and then X and Y, which are tangent vector fields along this function. And I uh, need to produce a number. So there's a, a kind of like the only one canonical way to do this essentially. And the way I, uh, what you do is that you have uh, two tangent vectors um, on M, you plug them in into the uh, symplectic form and this gives you then a function on S and then you integrate uh, this function over the volume form that you have. And uh, then you can see that uh, this one is really a non-degenerate that uh, follows essentially um, because the symplectic uh, manifold or the symplectic form on M was not, not a generate. And then you can also see that uh, it's a closed for two form. So we have a symplectic structure on the space of smooth functions. And um, uh, the space of smooth functions carries a, a natural action um, of the different morphism group um, of S. So um, that's just like by pre-composition. And you see that this uh, different morphism group uh, acts in a symplectic way. So it pre preserves the symplectic structure that we just defined. Um, so we are looking for a momentum map for this uh, action. So the first step in the definition of a momentum map is you need to say what uh, you understand as a dual. And for this, you identify um, the, uh, the space of vector fields that preserves the volume form with the n minus one forms that are closed. That's just like uh, plugging uh, the, the vector field that you have into your volume form to get an n minus one form. 
And then uh, there's a natural pairing between um, n minus one forms and one forms where you just take the batch product and then integrate over S. Um, and then you see that the dual is naturally identified with the space of one forms modulo the exact one forms. And uh, that's at least uh, the, uh, the, the regular part of the dual. And then uh, there's a, a, and the first observation is that um, if your symplectic form is exact, then you actually have a momentum map. And this momentum map is given by um, essentially the pullback of the, the preform. So you have a preform that's a one form, you pull it back by a function to get a one form on S, and then you take the equivalence class uh, um, modulo the exact forms. And then you can show the using um, essentially only partial integration and uh, the Catan formula that uh, this one is really the momentum map. Um, yeah. For the, the different morphism action uh, defined with respect to the symplectic structure. Um, so the question is okay, um, so that was for exact uh, symplectic forms. What happens if we have a not exact uh, symplectic um, uh, form on M? And uh, then it turns out that uh, there's actually not a symplectic form, uh, not a, a momentum map. And uh, the reason is that you can actually calculate the obstruction. So if you have like, usually in symplectic geometry, you have an obstruction for the existence of a momentum map. And if you want to calculate this for this particular example, it's uh, essentially saying that the pullback of the symplectic form needs to be exact. Um, so omega doesn't really need to be exact themselves, but uh, the pullback uh, for every smooth function on S needs to be exact. And uh, if you kind of like turn around this argumentation, then uh, it actually says that um, um, you have some conserved quantities um, that are obstructing the existing of a momentum map in the classical sense. And uh, that's uh, something that I want to explain uh, uh, now in more detail. And for this, we look at some uh, very simple example of a, a finite dimensional case where we also don't have a, um, a momentum map. Um, so that's, uh, we look at the torus. And uh, that's a uh, toss with the standard volume form uh, as a symplectic form. And we look uh, at the natural U1 action that's uh, just given by rotation uh, in one of the uh, S1 factors. And it's well known that it doesn't have a classical momentum map. And the reason is that uh, if I have the, uh, uh, the fundamental vector field generated by, uh, yeah, but yeah, and plug it into the symplectic form, I get uh, D of theta, um, where theta is the, um, the angle uh, that is kind of like the other angle, uh, which is not acted upon by the U1 action. Um, and that's uh, of course a, a closed form, but it's not exact. Uh, and um, to say that there actually exists some kind of momentum uh, map for this uh, particular case, um, Macduff introduced uh, the circle valued momentum maps. And in this particular case, we can say that uh, there exists a momentum map in this uh, U1 uh, spirit um, by saying that the momentum map uh, is essentially the projection on the second uh, U1 factor. Um, and uh, this already gives you some interesting um, um, new conserved quantities. Um, namely, for example, you can say that if you start with some um, closed path in the torus um, that's uh, depicted here on this picture uh, in blue, and uh, you will kind of like flow along it with some uh, Hamiltonian that is uh, invariant uh, under the U1 action that you're looking at, then you get some deformed uh, uh, circle. But uh, because the, this, uh, you have this momentum map and this uh, momentum map uh, is also conserved, you know that, for example, the winding number of the composition of the circle with the, um, um, uh, with the momentum map, which is a map from S1 to S1. Um, so it has a very defined winding number. And you know it because uh, the momentum map was conserved, you also know that uh, the winding number of this composition has, uh, is preserved. So this shows you that, uh, um, that the classical momentum map doesn't exist. And the reason because it's not existing is that because there are some kind of topolo topological obstructions. Or if you can kind of like turn around this argument and it says that there doesn't exist a classical momentum map because you have interesting topological conserved quantities, in this case, for example, the, the discrete winding numbers. And the momentum map kind of like is a too naive gadget, a gadget to store these uh, uh, conserved quantities that have a topological flavor. 
um, because it's just like a vector space and there's no um, kind of like space to store um, discrete information in a vector space. And um, that's why you need to pass to, uh, uh, yeah, this U1 valued momentum map in order to store, for example, the winding number. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Yeah, uh, is it possible just to consider so-called uh, multivalued moment map by considering, by replacing uh, a map with values in um, Lico algebra by a closed one form? Like in Morse theory, one can replace a Morse function by a closed one form and try to mimic as much as you can uh, the usual situation. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, then these are just like, uh... Um, the property that you have, uh, uh, that your action preserves the symplectic form, so that if then you know that these ones are, uh, if you plug in this, uh, the, the fundamental vector field in the symplectic form, you end up with a closed form. So that's yes, def yes. that's uh, still the case. But um, the question is, how much information do you still get out? For example, if there's something like symplectic reduction um, for these multi-valued uh, uh, moment maps, and I'm not aware that there exists a theory for this. Um, so I mean, uh, well, you have locally defined. So a multivalued function is basically a closed, a closed one form or something which is just locally defined. So it's, uh, it need not be integrable, necessarily integrable in the sense that you say, because of some topological, uh, well, if, if you don't have integrality condition satisfied. So, but it can still uh, make sense as a kind of multivalued gadget. Yes. Um, you just said remark. Yes, okay. Thanks. Yeah, um, but for our case, it's actually really important that we have a really uh, um, a value uh, or a map that uh, gives, in some sense, uh, a, a preform um, for this. Uh, like it's a closed form if you insert the, the um, fundamental vector fields, but um, it's in some sense uh, even more because it's uh, exact, but it's not quite exact, but uh, exact in a certain sense. Um, and that's actually quite important um, for us. Yeah. Um, Yep. Are there any more questions? Um, yeah, yeah, I have a question. Um, is, it, um, is it correct to identify it? So you have U1 appearing twice on this slide. There's a U1 action and a U1 valued momentum map. Yes. Is it, can we think of those as the same group or isn't one of them a kind of dual U1 for the other? Um, in this particular case with the um, U1, uh, um, like circle valued momentum maps by, of MacDuff, both of them are treated on, in the same way. Um, but we will see right now that one of them actually you should think as a dual uh, of the other one. So that's a, a really good remark. Okay, thanks. Yes, and uh, actually, um, yeah, let's uh, turn to this. Um, um, so the idea would be then to uh, generalize um, um, the, this um, circle value momentum map uh, to a, a moment map that is uh, taking values in some uh, kind of space um, so that we can apply this uh, to the diffeomorphism uh, group and uh, the action of the diffeomorphism group. And uh, the tool that we're using uh, comes uh, for the Poisson geometry. And uh, I mean, there needs to be a reason why I'm in a, invited here to speak at the Poisson um, conference. Um, so uh, the gadget that we are coming uh, uh, or looking at uh, is uh, the Lou Weinstein momentum map. And uh, it's uh, defined as follows. So you start with a Poisson Lie group. That means that it's a, uh, it's a Poisson manifold and the group uh, multiplication and inversion are Poisson maps. And uh, then you define, um, see that uh, the Poisson tensor needs to vanish at the identity and you define its uh, linearization, which gives you then um, uh, a map from the uh, Lie algebra to the um, to yeah, the batch product of the Lie algebra, and uh, it turns out that uh, because uh, you started with a Poisson tensor, then you see that uh, this uh, the dual map of this uh, um, epsilon um, satisfies the copy identity, and um, so this gives you then uh, a Lie bracket on the dual of the Lie algebra that you started with, and. Uh, then you can uh, uh, look at the dual Lie group, um, um, which is just a, a unique connected and simply connected group that you uh, that integrates uh, this uh, dual um, or the Poisson, uh, the, sorry, the, the Lie bracket on the dual of the Lie algebra. 
Um, so that's the definition of the uh, dual Lie group. And now we have some Poisson manifold M with some Poisson tensor uh, omega. And uh, we uh, have a Poisson action of the group. So the, uh, I remind you that this means that uh, uh, the, the, this map, that uh, the action map is really a Poisson uh, map. And that doesn't mean that um, for each uh, fixed year, um, uh, the action preserves the, the Poisson uh, structure on M. And uh, in this uh, setting, um, Lu and Weinstein introduced uh, the, uh, a group valued momentum map. Um, so that's a momentum map that takes values in the dual uh, Lie group and uh, satisfies uh, this uh, uh, equation that um, you, for each uh, value of the Lie algebra, you consider the left invariant. Uh, um, um, you can, yeah, you feel each uh, this Lie algebra element you feel as a as a co-vector uh, on the dual, um, and then extended by uh, to a left invariant uh, um, one form on the dual, and then you pull it back uh, by the by the momentum map to get a, a one form on M, and then you uh, plug this one form uh, into your Poisson tensor, and you require that. Uh, uh, this one is given up to a sign by the fundamental vector field. And uh, if you then uh, look at the particular case um, of, um, of a symplectic um, manifold, so the, the Poisson manifold that you started with a symplectic, then uh, this equation actually uh, comes down to something that uh, looks almost like uh, the normal momentum map equation, um, except that uh, you replace um, this, uh, the exterior derivative uh, of the momentum map by the left uh, logarithmic derivative, um, which is defined in this equation. Um, so that uh, it's a uh, it's a nice theory and this has a lot of applications. And uh, we first uh, thought that maybe we can use this directly in our setting, um, but we have a, a really a strong problem, uh, namely that it's not known, at least uh, to us, um, if these uh, different morphism groups that we're looking at are actually Poisson Lie groups. So, um, so we thought we, uh, we thought we uh, want to use this uh, momentum map, but it uh, wasn't clear if this actually fits into uh, the Poisson uh, setting that uh, um, that we are looking at. Um, so we stared uh, quite uh, some time on this last equation, eh? and then we figured out um, to make sense of this equation, we don't need any Poisson structure on the Lie group. Um, but the only thing that we need is uh, some uh, dual Lie group and uh, some pairing. So that we first need kind of like the value, the moment map needs to take values in some Lie D group so that we know that uh, what is a left logarithmic with derivative is. And then we need some pairing between uh, the Lie algebra of this Lie group of the original Lie group um, uh, or Lie algebra in order to make sense of the pairing that occurs in this equation. And uh, that's uh, how we introduced uh, the notion of a group valued momentum map. And um, so, yeah, first let me recall the setting. So we start with some symplectic manifold. Um, we start with some Lie group that acts on M. And we have uh, some arbitrary Lie group, um, which I denote here by G star, um, that has a Lie algebra, um, which is dual to the uh, Lie algebra of the acting group. And then uh, the group value momentum map is defined as a map that takes values in this uh, dual Lie group and satisfies the equation that we just saw. So as a first special case, um, you see that uh, you recover um, the usual momentum map relation by just taking the, the dual Lie group to be a, just a Lie algebra. So nothing exciting there. Um, you also see that uh, the circle valued momentum map um, you can recover by taking uh, U1. Um, um, so if your group acting as U1, and then you can also take the dual um, to be U1. And here it's, uh, for example, uh, uh, you see this uh, quite nicely that uh, uh, one of the U1 is really the acting U1, and then this other U1 is a, you should think as the dual uh, group. Uh, do it to the uh, the one that. So acts. sorry, you don't assume any relation between Lie algebra structure in G and G star. No, nope, that's the point that we don't uh, assume anything that uh, there is uh, no compatibility uh, conditions uh, on the Lie algebra no structure. No whatsoever. No. Nope. Or you will need uh, some weakened form. 
Uh, no, uh, it's not needed for uh, our purposes, but uh, I should point out that for the different morphism groups, um, the dual Lie group uh, turns out to be abelian. Um, um, so that's uh, some uh, simplification there. Okay. So do you, so you, so it, you could ask that G acted on G dual, but I, it seems almost as if the point of your talk is that G will not act on G dual exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, or, there is a, there, in the examples yeah, we sure, look at, yeah. uh, the, the examples that we look at, they, they have a natural action of G on the, the dual Lie group, but um, um, that integrates in some sense the, the core joint action. Yes. Um, but but the point, equivalent? Uh, yes, so I can comment ab uh, about the equivalence okay. properties at the end. Um, but uh, the point was uh, uh, like uh, that there's no action of the dual Lie group on the Lie group itself. Right, okay. So, so that, that's uh, really unknown if there's something like this, but uh, the other way around there's uh, a natural action. Oh, great, thank you. Yeah. Yes. And uh, there's also in the literature that was also introduced as uh, cylinder valued momentum maps, and they are also a special case of this particular co valued momentum map. And um, the upshot is that uh, the co valued momentum maps exist more often than the ordinary momentum maps, um, for example, in the U1 case. Um, that's quite uh, obvious, um, but it also is the case that uh, not every action has a, a group value momentum map in the sense. And um, so first one uh, remark why I'm actually allowed to call these mom moment maps, um, and that's uh, because they satisfy uh, um, the Noether theorem. So um, just uh, recalling that uh, you start with a simple like manifold and you have the uh, group acting and you say that you have a group value momentum up in this uh, particular sense and you have some Hamiltonian that is G invariant. Um, then the Noether theorem tells you that uh, the, the group value momentum map uh, is constant along the integral curves of the Hamiltonian vector field. And the proof is essentially the same um, as uh, uh, yeah, the classical proof for the uh, normal uh, momentum map. But the important thing is that uh, um, that uh, these uh, uh, group value momentum maps decode uh, more conserved quantities. Um, for example, they, like they, uh, they have discrete uh, nature that has some topological um, character. For example, I can uh, take just like the non-connected uh, um, uh, group as a target, and then uh, uh, the moment map uh, um, composed with uh, yeah, the, which tells me in which connected component I am, which is a di discrete map, um, is then constant in time along uh, if the Hamiltonian was G invariant. So this really gives us uh, discrete conserved quantities that are kind of like stored uh, in the discrete valued momentum maps. And uh, that's essentially uh, the, the main takeaway that uh, if your moment map doesn't exist, then, then maybe it's uh, good to look at these group value moment maps because they are more general and they uh, um, have uh, some uh, interesting topological uh, conserved quantities. And uh, in the, the second reminder of the uh, talk, I want to now to, uh, apply this theory um, to, uh, to mapping spaces and then also um, to the Teichmüller space. Um, so first, uh, maybe that's a good, uh, time to ask a question about uh, the general group value moment maps. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, yep. Can you hear me? I don't. Yes, I hear you. Yeah. So um, looking at this, this slide now, uh, if I remember correctly, and this may be not entirely applicable to infinite dimensional groups, uh, the problem if you have an action of a, of a, of a group which preserves a symplectic form, there, I believe the obstruction theory is you have to have, if, if both the first Lie algebra cohomology and the second Lie algebra cohomology vanish, then, um, then you do have a moment map. Now, typically, as, as, as in Voronov's question, if your problem is with the first cohomology, at least for a compact Lie group, you can get rid of it by going to a, uh, uh, to a cover. Uh, for the second cohomology, one has to go to a central extension. So I guess my question is in this situation of diffeomorphism groups, does that also fail or is that just an alternative? Would that be just an alternative way of doing it? So um, is, is the failure due to this, these, these cohomological obstructions or is there something else going on that's particularly infinite dimensional? Um, 
no, there's no, like why, why there's no moment map uh, is exactly because this obstruction and in the particular case, for example, when you have the volume preserving diffeomorphism group, um, then you can actually calculate what is the, the first um, cohomology uh, of this and it turns out to be um, um, H1 uh, of uh, S, like uh, the, the first uh, cohomology uh, of the, the surface. Um, and then you see that, uh, that you can calculate what for this particular action that we're just looking at, um, um, what is the obstruction? And then you see really it's the pullback of the uh, symplectic form. Uh, sorry, it was the second co uh, cohomology. So it's a pullback of the symplectic form um, that is uh, the obstruction um, and that has to be um, uh, vanish in order for a moment map to exist. So it's a kind of like you really can use the traditional tools to see that there is no moment map um, um, in a general sense, yeah. So is, would there be a moment map for some sort of central extension? For instance, for loop groups that happens, right? The, the loop group has some H2, but if you go to the central extension of the loop group, then there can be nice moment maps. Yes, um, the central extension also come in, but uh, they are for the, that you have a moment map, which is uh, equivariant. And uh, that's, that's actually right. one of the things that uh, kind of like people use, um, uh, that you have uh, certain mm -hmm. moment maps uh, for different morphism groups, uh, which are not equivariant. And then you can use, uh, for example, uh, the constant uh, pre um procedure to uh, construct uh, uh, Lie groups that integrate uh, central extensions or add central extension of different morphism groups. So you can construct a uh, central extension of different morphism groups in this way. And that's actually, uh, uh, a nice uh, application. Um, but for this, you need some sense of a uh, moment map and uh, uh, they don't always exist. I see, okay, well, let me ask you afterwards. Thanks. Yep. Okay, I, I have a question also. Um, could you go back one slide, please? Yes. Um, yeah, so I assume that the only case in which this is interesting is when M itself is not connected. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. That's yes. all. Uh, but you see like in uh, these particular cases that we're looking at uh, uh, function spaces and so on. So they have a really uh, hard to understand topology. Um, um, mm -hmm. and, um, so, and then in some sense it's exactly this that the diffeomorphism group is uh, sensitive to the topology of uh, the space, uh, um, of course. And so, uh, and that's somehow reflected in uh, this action and the conserved quantities are then also having some topological flavor. And um, nice. yes. Yeah, so the different morphism groups can certainly be non-connected. So, yes, um, exactly. Um, so let's return to this uh, example of the mapping space. Um, so the setting is as before, we have a compact manifold, the volume form and the target space is a, a symplectic manifold. And um, we look at the, the composition um, that gives you the different morphism action. And as we have seen before, there exists a moment map uh, of uh, um, the symplectic form is exact. Um, so what happens now if we uh, look at um, uh, these group valued moment maps and um, the idea there is to uh, give some geometric idea, uh, uh, geometric meaning to this uh, dual space. So we saw that the dual space uh, of the volume preserving vector fields uh, can be identified as one forms modulo exact one forms. And um, so to give this some geometric interpretation, you can think of a one form on S as a connection one form on the trivial bundle. And then if you continue this line of interpretation, then it's natural to view um, smooth functions on S as uh, gauge transformations or uh, yeah, gauge algebra. And in the sense, you see that uh, the space of connections um, on the trivial bundle modulo gauge transformations uh, can be naturally identified with uh, the, the dual of the uh, Lie algebra of volume preserving vector fields. And that naturally leads to of the following idea that we take uh, the dual Lie group that we started with uh, to be uh, the group of all isomorphism classes of U1 connections um, or U1 bundles with uh, principal U1 connections, modulo gauge transformations. So if there's one thing that you want to take away from uh, this talk, then uh, uh, that's please this one, um, that uh, the volume preserving vector fields are in some sense dual uh, to the group of uh, isomorphism classes of U1 bundles with connection. And uh, as you see, uh, this particular group uh, has uh, two properties um, that are really important for us. Namely, it's not connected. Um, in this particular case, um, 
uh, coup uh, U1 bundles are classified by their churn um, class, and these are giving you the uh, not like the co connected components of the this group. And that's are also you not bundles trivial. Sorry, are you bundles trivial or, or, or not necessarily because you write S cross U1? Yeah, so uh, like for the, the dual of the Lie algebra, they are trivial. Um, but the point was uh, that I want to have a, a, a group that integrates this Lie algebra uh, or the dual of the Lie algebra. And uh, because these ones were um, connections on the trivial bundle, it's natural to uh, generalize this and say that um, I'm looking at the group of all bundles that are not necessarily trivial and uh, look at isomorphism classes of connections on these bundles. And what's the group operation? Um, it's uh, if you think of these as uh, uh, tensor it's line bundles, then it's just tensor product. And addition of connections, basically. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and uh, this group is uh, not connected because uh, uh, the bundles don't need to be trivial. Um, so the connected component would be uh, exactly the trivial bundles, and it's also not simply connected because you have uh, the Jacobian torus which parameterizes um, flat and trivial connections. Um, and th these are sitting in the in this group of isomorphism classes. So, it's, uh, so the topology of this uh, group is uh, um, yeah, really uh, um, complicated, but well understood. And we use this uh, um, for the different uh, morphism groups. And um, um, coming back to this example, so what we do now is we replace uh, the target of our moment map by this um, this tool space, which is a uh, line bundles uh, over uh, S modulo um, uh, gauge transformations. And then we have the following theorem that uh, if we assume that our um, original symplectic uh, manifold uh, was pre-quantizable, so there exists a line bundle um, and uh, a connection on this line bundle such that the curvature of this connection is uh, the symplectic form then the diffeomorphism group's uh, uh, action has a group valued moment map and that's given by the pullback of this uh, line bundle. And uh, that's a natural generalization from this uh, theorem before um, where we had that uh, if the symplectic form is exact, then we can take the pre-quantum bundle to be the trivial bundle. And then uh, we recover with this uh, uh, statement uh, the, uh, the previous one. But the important case here is that uh, our target is now no longer uh, to be the, only the, the, the connections on the trivial bundle, but they can also have non-trivial um, um, yeah, topological information there. And for example, um, uh, because it's, uh, the target is not connected, um, you get, for example, Klebsch variables for topological non-trivial configurations. And um, also uh, this uh, reformulation um, um, that it's not simply connected gives, for example, that you can recover the Liouville class of a uh, Lagrangian embedding um, using this uh, moment map picture as the conserved quantity um, for the different morphism action. So there's uh, quite some well-known uh, topological information that can be recovered if you go to these uh, group valued moment maps. And um, for the remaining, uh, I want to uh, specialize to, uh, um, to the Teichmüller space, which was our initial motivation, and um, uh, see how these group valued moment maps apply to the Teichmüller space. Um, just uh, for some background, uh, and uh, what is the Teichmüller space? Um, so we start with some uh, compact oriented uh, smooth surface. Um, for print, uh, simplicity, we assume that it doesn't have any boundaries. And topologically, of course, uh, just uh, characterized by their genius. And um, then if you uh, pass to the universal cover, you see from the uni uniformization theorem, essentially that um, you only have three choices. And uh, uh, they are either biholomorphic to the Riemann sphere, um, to the complex plane or to the hyperbolic plane. And uh, that's also consistent with the gauss bonnet theorem. Um, and uh, these examples have done constant scalar curvature of uh, plus one, zero, or minus one. Um, so this, uh, from this picture, you see that already that uh, the constant scalar curvature of one or zero are essentially not very interesting. But uh, the only interesting classes that you can have are constant scalar curvature minus uh, one. Um, matrices. And uh, 
So the Teich Mendel space is exactly the moduli spaces of these uh, uh, interesting um, yeah, Riemann matrices. So you look at Riemann matrix that have constant scalar curvature minus one. And uh, there's a, a important uh, theorem um, that says that um, the Teichmüller space is uh, um, diffeomorphic to a, a cotangent uh, bundle um, where the dimension uh, is finite dimensions and uh, finite dimension and given by uh, determined by the genus. And uh, there is an important property that this one is a ca carrying a natural metric that is a, uh, uh, the Val Peterson metric. And under this uh, uh, diffeomorphisms with the cotangent bundle, it actually goes over to the natural um, um, yeah, structure on the cotangent, the symplectic structure on the cotangent bundle. Um, so these are, uh, uh, you see that the Teichmüller space is a symplectic space. And the idea or the question is now, um, can we say that the scalar curvature is um, the moment map in some sense? And uh, this uh, is answered by the following theorem. Um, uh, so we first need to have uh, a symplectic form on the, the space of uh, all matrices um, that are compatible with some volume form. So we uh, endow our closed surface with a volume form. And we look at all the, the matrices that are compatible with it. And uh, the simplest way to define the, or the, more natural, the most natural way is uh, to define a symplectic form is to realize that um, Symmetric spaces can be seen as uh, um, reductions uh, of the frame bundle um, from SL2R to U1. Um, and these ones are identified then um, with the space of all sections of this associated bundle. And um, the observation here is that um, the SL2R over U1 is naturally uh, the core, one of the core joints orbits of SL2R. And thus uh, is, has a natural uh, uh, symplectic structure. And then we use essentially a, a nonlinear version of this uh, mapping space construction where we had uh, uh, maps from some volume form to a symplectic form. And here we have some uh, maps from a volume manifold um, to a, a symplectic fiber bundle. Um, but essentially uh, uh, that is a bit more complication, but uh, essentially um, the theory carries over. So we have a symplectic form. And if you write down what this uh, symplectic form is really looking like, uh, really looks like, um, then it's uh, given by this uh, formula that is in the theorem here. Um, so um, essentially it's that you um, take the trace uh, of uh, the composition of uh, uh, the first uh, symmetric tensor with the volume form and then the second symmetric tensor to get a function on S and then you integrate it. And uh, then uh, the, the statement of the main theorem uh, is that um, if you take uh, this, uh, yeah, you can of course uh, scale also the symplectic form. And if you take the right scaling to be an integer, then the diffeomorphism group has a group valued momentum map. And it's given by this map that uh, assigns to a metric. It's, uh, um, it's canonical bundle. So the canonical bundle, so on a surface you have a, um, a canonical bundle uh, associated to each metric and um, the complex structure that is given by the metric and the symplectic form. And uh, this canonical bundle carries uh, uh, also a canonical symplectic, uh, a canonical um, connection, which is essentially the, um, induced by the Levice Vita connection. And um, uh, this bundle is uh, uh, the moment map, that's the main result. And we know that, uh, um, that the connection of this uh, canonical bundle um, has curvature um, given by the scalar curvature of the metric times uh, the symplectic form or the, the volume form on the surface. Um, so in this sense, uh, we see that uh, this problem, um, how the diffeomorphism groups, uh, what is the uh, moment map is really telling you, it's not the scalar curvature which is the moment map, but it's really the, the uh, more integrated version, which is uh, the canonical bundle. And uh, in some sense, uh, this theorem tells you actually that the name canonical bundle is really uh, the right uh, name for this because it's the, the conserved quantity that is associated to the diffeomorphism um, or the volume preserving diffeomorphism group. And then we can use this observation um, to see uh, uh, to um, really view the Teichmüller space. 
as a uh, reduced space. Um, so the Teichmiller space is uh, then with, uh, in terms of this moment map, um, this group valued moment map is then given as the inverse image of uh, all, all circle bundles that have the curvature um, given by uh, minus the, the volume. And um, then you quotient out the diffeomorphism group. So it's not quite uh, a symplectic uh, quotient, but uh, the set that you uh, of all circle bundles with um, curvature um, minus the volume um, is essentially um, uh, an orbit um, under the diffeomorphism group. So in this sense, uh, the Teichmüller space and the Riemann modular spaces by extension are then um, symplectic orbit quotients. There are a lot of uh, other applications of this theory. Um, for example, you can uh, look at uh, the other coagents orbits of SL2R, because uh, as this one coagent orbit was essentially all that you needed to um, get the Teichmüller space. Um, and so then you get, uh, for example, symplectic uh, um, versions to the other coagent orbits, which gives you uh, the hyperbolic uh, coagent orbits, gives you some hyperbolic version of the Teichmüller theory and um, the, um, the parabolic uh, uh, coagent orbit gives you um, some form of weighted Lagrangian distributions on the surface. You can also go to higher dimensions, and that was actually one of the motivations uh, of uh, Donaldson, um, where this, uh, this uh, picture of the scalar curvature then uh, gives you uh, the kähler einstein um, condition. And Donaldson used this uh, idea of uh, moment maps and the duality of uh, geometric invariant theory um, to rephrase the, the equation that, uh, that uh, you have a kähler einstein matrix in terms of some stability. And that turns out to be a uh, the Yao um, Tian uh, Donaldson theory. And uh, as I said before, you can also apply uh, this theory to other um, um, settings. For example, if you apply this uh, to the hydrodynamics, um, uh, then you get Klebsch variables um, for uh, topological non trivial flows. So Klebsch variables for, um, for flows that have non trivial helicity. And there's also some applications to Lagrange embeddings and also to a gauge theoretic uh, modular spaces, for example, flat connections or cyberic witten um, theory. And uh, um, with this, I uh, want to thank you for your attention and uh, I want to uh, summarize uh, shortly uh, what I told you today. Um, so I uh, introduced uh, these group valued moment maps that were inspired by the Lou Weinstein moment map uh, in Poisson geometry. And we saw that they exist more often than the ordinary moment, moment maps, but not always. And they have the important property that they encode certain discrete or topological conserved quantities. And uh, the main takeaway message is that uh, the diffeomorphism groups have moment maps that take values in groups of circle bundles with connections. And then uh, the churn class and uh, other important topological properties of these bundles encode uh, conserved quantities that are discrete. And the application that I showed was uh, that the Teichmüller space uh, can be uh, viewed as a symplectic orbit space. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Well, thanks a lot. Thank well, please, questions or comments? Yeah, you can unmute yourself or you can raise your electronic hand. Uh, yeah, Francis. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say a, a bit more about applications to Lagrange embeddings. Yes. Um, let me go back. Um, yes, to this uh, um, slide. Um, so you see that uh, um, the moment map is essentially the pullback. Um, yeah, or what you want to think is that, that the, uh, uh, the moment map is the pullback of the symplectic form. It's not quite, it's the pullback of the pre-quantum bundle. But um, if you then uh, want to see, for example, the Lagrange property comes in, in as the, that you take the inverse image of all these um, maps that uh, um, for which, uh, like the, the yeah for which essentially the pullback vanishes. Um, so, um, I think that was not really clear. Um, 
Um, so you have this, uh, the moment map uh, is uh, giving uh, as the pullback of the symplectic form to the surface. And uh, if you uh, say it, uh, uh, restrict to the level set of uh, zero, that would mean that uh, you have, um, um, yeah, sub-manifolds uh, uh, that are isotropic because the um, pullback of the symplectic form vanishes. Um, and then uh, this conserved quantity that we get uh, out of the moment map that was uh, given by the Jacobi um, torus, that's then essentially, you can see this, the, that this one is the Leo real class of the Lagrangian embedding. Um, so that's the connection um, of, of the isotropic embedding. Um, so that's uh, the connection between this uh, infinite dimensional moment maps and Lagrangian embeddings. Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions or comments? Uh, perhaps in a similar vein, uh, could you say a couple of words about those uh, hyperbolic uh, version of Teich Miller spaces? What, what, what are they, or what are they geometric? What, what are they doing geometrically? Um, it's a really good uh, uh, question, actually. Um, um, yeah, so uh, you start uh, here for, instead of uh, taking uh, the elliptic. Uh, uh, quadrant orbit, you just take the hyperbolic orbit and then you get a, a similar formulas, uh, formulas for the symplectic form and uh, also for the coupe valued moment map. Um, but uh, so it's uh, just like instead of uh, looking at um, Riemann matrices on the surface, you're looking at uh, hyperbolic uh, matrices. And um, so formally everything works like the same, um, but the important problem- so, so Hyperbolic means Lorentzian or- Yes, exactly, yeah, so, 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 so the, this, this would be, you, you would be study some kind of moduli of Lorentzian structures? Yes, exactly. So these are Lorentzian matrices, so they have a signature one and one um, on the surface. And uh, um, they are also studied by physicists uh, in terms of like, um, uh, because they're interested in, uh, uh, um, um, but general relativity on uh, two dimensions. Um, so the, uh, that's a particular case. And then um, uh, no, formally you get uh, this reduced space uh, uh, by the same uh, procedure. Um, it's just like taking the, the scalar curvature of the Lorentzian matrix instead of the Riemann matrix. But of course the problem is uh, then is this final, is this a uh, modular space finite dimensional or can you say something about uh, um, is it actually a manifold, for example? Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, important problems coming in um, from the analysis side um, because, um, um, yeah, I mean, essentially here you have some ellip uh, elliptic theory uh, behind um, for the Teichmiller space. And uh, this one would then be no longer an elliptic equation, but a hyperbolic equation. Um, so the it, so the analysis part of this uh, is completely open, and uh, I'm not sure. I, um, I recall that long ago on the physics side for this two-dimensional whatever two-dimensional story, uh, I've seen some kind of uh, you know, for instance, Thomas Strobel. He was investigating how what kind of universes you can build, what kind of yeah. I think you 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 glue different Penrose diagrams together and. You try to figure out what what kind of spaces one can obtain. Is it uh, would, would it would it enter the game, or you you want everything to be smooth, so there would be no so to say horizons, right? So once you you start doing this Lorentzian geometry, then then there are kind of various non-trivial effects that may come up. But is it is it in uh, in in this hyperbolic version, or there you would like to have everything, so to say? smooth far away from the horizons? Yes, I think it's a really good uh, uh, question. Um, also like we assume, for example, that uh, the surface is uh, uh, closed and so on. Um, mm. I'm not sure how, if, if this might, may, might be too restrictive and you might replace mm. this uh, closed by some, um, with something with boundary and to encode some um, boundary conditions at infinity. Mm. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It's essentially open as far as I know. If this uh, is a, has some analytic background that you can make sense of these things, um, and it's still uh, physically relevant. Um, yeah. Okay, Th thank you. In uh, Lorentzian case, yeah. you have only characteristic zero, right? Um, sorry, what do you mean? Uh, in, if you have Lorentzian metric, so I think that you must have only characteristic zero because you have the central line, basically central line, or the um, light cone. Oh, so you have non-vanishing 
uh, vector field or non-vention director field on your manifold. But, but Theodore, what, what about genus one, right? For sure, you can you can have a Lorentzian metric on the torus, whatever dx square minus dt square on a flat on on a flat two, two, two dimensional torus, so which doesn't seem to be genus zero. No, no, it, it, it doesn't. Yes, that's, that's right. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 but in the meantime, maybe Dima can, can ask his question. Dima? Uh, yes. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. And my question is, well, what about the other kind of group valued moment maps? Um, the ones uh, studied by Alexei Malkin and Myron can, uh, are those completely orthogonal to this story or are they also included somehow? Um, that's a really good question. Um, um, they are both, I would say. Um, so let's go back to the definition of uh, our group valued moment map. Um, so there's a, a few interesting or important observations. First is that uh, we still have a symplectic manifold. Um, so um, we say that uh, uh, the symplectic form is closed. That's, for example, no longer uh, the case for these quasi Hamiltonian spaces. Um, also, um, in the, the normal uh, setting, you would say that you have a Lie group acting on M and that preserves the symplectic form. But um, once you want to have these group-valued moment maps, you see actually that uh, the symplectic form is no longer, uh, cannot be preserved uh, any longer. Um, so that you um, have some conditions um, as long as, uh, uh, sorry, as soon as you say that uh, the dual D group is non-abelian at least. Um, and that's the same also in the Poisson uh, case where you, um, which is the reflection essentially saying that uh, the Poisson uh, uh, action is uh, really as an action from the Poisson um, Lie group times M to M. Uh, so it's not a Poisson action or uh, if once you fix uh, the G. So there's kind of like some uh, Poisson uh, structure coming in from the action that makes it a Poisson um, map. Um, and that's uh, just a reflection of uh, uh, this uh, reformulation that uh, the symplectic form is no longer invariant under the group if you have a non-abelian uh, dual. Um, um, and that's also in contrast uh, to the uh, quasi Hamiltonian picture where you say that uh, actually you require so your symplectic um, form uh, to be invariant. So in some sense, it's kind of like exactly just a dual uh, trading that you say, um, okay, we have a symplectic form, um, but in the quasi Hamiltonian, you give up the symplectici symplecticity um, and uh, therefore still keep like the condition that you have, uh, um, that you're, uh, so form is uh, invariant under the group and uh, we give up kind of like the invariants uh, but still keep the uh, symplectic picture. Um, so these are kind of like uh, some um, orthogonal ways uh, to view this. Okay, uh, thank you. I uh, maybe reformulate this a little bit. Yes. Yeah, well, if I recall correctly, um, one of the main motivations of introducing these uh, quasi Poisson actions and uh, group valued momentum maps uh, uh, was to you know to apply to this uh, you know uh, uh, this example of uh, of flat connections modular space flat connections um, and uh, so if you use uh, this approach you can avoid uh, infinite dimensional spaces and groups altogether. Yeah, at the cost of introducing all these you know, weird things like you know, the reform uh, and so on. So um, uh, have you uh, tried to think along those lines, uh, for instance, in the case of the Weil, the Peterson metric? Um, um, like just, you know, if you if, if maybe uh, 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 do something like that to avoid uh, these infinite dimensional crochet groups. Um. Yes, that would be an interesting um, few. Um, so the, uh, you're right, like the main motivations uh, for um, these um, quasi Hamiltonian spaces uh, why um, Ernest Hübschmann and uh, Lisa Treffer looked at these things where um, 
essentially uh, because they wanted to do some plectric reduction by stages, um, if you want to think like this. So what you have is that you fix a point um, and then you look at uh, first at the action of the uh, symplectic uh, of the uh, gauge transformations that are, are vanishing at this particular point. Then you quotient out this one, you get a, a finer dimension, a symplectic space, uh, which only has uh, the remaining symmetry that is kind of like given by the action of this particular point. So that's a finite dimensional G action. So that's uh, essentially what they want to do. And then the problem is that you can't do a symplectic reduction by this point at gauge transformations. And uh, if you look at this, um, um, then it's essentially this condition which I have here um, that uh, the, the bifurcation lemma stops working. Um, and that's uh, actually coming in in this particular case with the pointed gauge transformations. Um, because if you take V to be the orbit of the pointed gauge transformations and take the double orthogonal, then you get actually the full orbit of the gauge transformations. So although uh, your action is free, your moment map is no longer subjective. Um, so which is kind of like really an infinite dimensional uh, uh, phenomenon. And so you can't do a symplectic reduction uh, with the pointed uh, gauge transformation. Um, and then that's kind of like at least uh, how I view this uh, is kind of like as a way out of this, you do this in some way formally and try to um, find something that replaces this uh, first uh, stage uh, and come up with this quasi Hamiltonian uh, um, space. I'm not sure if this uh, applies also to as a second part um, to your uh, qu uh, question with the Teichmuller space. Um, I'm not sure if there's a, a natural infinite dimensional um, group that you can divide out to, to get something uh, finite dimensional um, that uh, um, like as a kind of like step in between. Um, in some sense, it's already that you have the, the Teichmuller space where you uh, quotient out the free part um, and then you have uh, something that acts non-freely to get the Riemann moduli spaces. Um, so in some sense, it's already uh, like the Riemann moduli spaces already a reduction by stages. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's something like a, a big enough group in between. Yes, the, well, fixing a point uh, that uh, you'd be talking about isometries then. Um, yes, but that's uh, really uh, fixing a point uh, in this uh, um, for this particular case with the um, uh, gauge transformations acting on the space of symplectic connections. So that was where you needed to fix a point to get a free action. Um, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, Alan? Uh, can you hear me? I'm, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, my question is whether um, it's um, possible or useful to use diffeology so that you can avoid the issues connected with the infinite dimensions um, since you're not actually doing any analysis, it seems. Yes, uh, so in this talk, I almost didn't do any analysis. Um, uh, that's true. Um, mostly ignored uh, all the, the stuff that is coming from infinite dimensions. Um, it, I think it really depends on what you want to do. If, like, of course, you can just like define, uh, like go to the, uh, do some plectric reduction and say that you have a diffological uh, reduced space. Um, but then it depends a bit on what you want to do uh, with your reduced space. Um, for example, like, uh, I mean, in some sense, you can also do this with modulized spaces. And but uh, uh, people are really interested in the, the local structure of these modulized spaces because they want to mm -hmm. integrate, for example, over the, the modulized space. Um, that was Donald doing in, uh, with his uh, invariance for the four dimensional uh, manifolds. Um, so you want to integrate, for example, um, over these uh, uh, modulized spaces, or you want to study uh, um, in Teichmuller space uh, um, billiards and kind of like uh, symplectic flows on this uh, reduced uh, spaces then. So in, for these things, I think it's really important to know that you have a, a local model and you know that you have a, a stratified symplectic space, for example, um, instead of just like some diffological object. But uh, it depends really on what you want to do. Yeah, I guess you could try to, to prove that the diffeological object that you get is actually a finite dimensional manifold or a variety. Yes, but I don't know any particular um, kind of like tools that allows uh, kind of like wouldn't amount to a local structure anyway. Um, um, so 
Yes, I mean, oh. if, if you have these particular tools, then it uh, might be a valuable strategy. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I should probably say that in the meantime, Theodore corrected me in the chat and the, this example of a torus with a flat structure exactly has early characteristic zero as he wanted. So he was right. Okay, <laughs> okay yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, if not, Tobias, uh, thanks again uh, for a great talk. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Next week, we have Claudia Scheinbauer, who speaks on Global Poisson. Well, thanks for coming, and see you next week. Bye-bye.